I'm Sue Nelson and welcome to another episode of Create the Future, a new podcast series brought to you by the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering. Today I'm joined by two engineers who encompass the integration of technology and infrastructure needed to produce smart cities. They are Larissa Suzuki, a Senior Manager for Machine Learning Platforms at Oracle and an Assistant Professor at UCL and Andrew Comer, Director of the Cities Business Unit at Bureau Happold Engineering. I'm going to begin by the definition of a smart city because basically I've read so many of them and I want to make sure I've got it right. Here's how I view it. It's a city that uses technology to make things work more efficiently and sustainably. Everything from transportation and sanitation to power supplies and along the way, improve the quality of life for those who live there. And by technology, we mean primarily the internet and data. Larissa, would you agree with that? I do believe that we need to make use of the data and the technology, but I believe that we can only achieve a smart city if we make those two things to work for the benefit of the people we are building them for. So a smart city can only be smart if that mirror any solution that we put out there mirror the society we are building them for to address really real cases for people. Andrew, I know you work all over the world at the moment. You're doing a lot of work in in Saudi Arabia. Does a a smart city mean the same in Europe as it does in, say, the Middle East or Africa or America? Is is that definition the same? I think broadly speaking, you're probably right. There are lots of nuances that are involved, and um, I think it, it depends really on what the aims and aspirations of the of the various players are, but by and large, I, w- I would concur with the uh, the introduction, Gabe. The only thing I would add is that I think there are some fundamental principles that need to be addressed before you could o- start to think about overlaying technology onto a city platform. They've they've got to be planned, designed, and constructed correctly before you can even think about the way in which technology can help with the sustainable approach. Well, here's what the chairman of the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering Foundation, Lord Brown, had to say when it came to thinking about the definition of smart cities. Engineers understand the system impact of changes. So more people in more places, how to make it more habitable, more enjoyable, how to get traffic around in the right way and how to do it intelligently. It's everything that we don't see happening in most big cities at the moment where people dig up the roads willy-nilly and cause gridlock everywhere because no one has an idea of how to plan the whole system. Which is exactly what you said, Andrew. (laughs) I'm pleased to say it's uh, planning and and integration. Indeed. What is the first smart city? Have we got one? Do we know there was a time when we thought, ah, this is it? This idea started with the concept of digital cities in the 60s in the United States when community networks started to emerge, giving people access to information about the city all online. So you could see about events, about cost, rubbish collection, all that information. One of the things that then started to give rise to smart cities was because in between digital cities in the 60s, And the evolution of pervasive computing, we started embedding sensors everywhere, collecting data from everywhere. And the idea of smart is to get insights from the data so we can learn how to do better. But the problem that we have as of today is infusing technology into old vintage, like cities like London, is really, really uh, difficult and very complicated. And also bringing all stakeholders together together. Uh, to agree on a way forward because if energy suppliers, water providers and transport providers, they don't have the same understanding on how the city is growing people are going to do X here Y over there and Z over here so we will never have a consensus of how much housing we have to provide to ensure that every single person living to a particular city will have access to food uh, jobs and healthcare and clean water and energy so we need to bring everybody together and integrate not only the technology but also the stakeholders they have to all join up together well Andrew you had a you know very good experience of something similar with the Olympic Games because you're using London which as Larissa says has an existing pretty old (laughs) infrastructure but you were actually on a site that wasn't necessarily fit for purpose when you led 
Bureau Happel's engineering team for building the Olympic Park in, in 2012. It, it was considered a massive success. It was the, considered the greenest Olympic Games at the time. Would you call what you did building a sort of smart neighbourhood at the time that you did it? Explain what you, you actually did for people who are not necessarily aware of all the things that you had to build for that site. Looking back now, it seems some distance ago, but... Um, it's only seven two, years. <laughs> seven years since the event, but 14 years since... In fact, it's probably 15 years since and, and, and longer since London started planning for the Games. And I think the one of the big success stories was not necessarily the uh, the focus that was given to the Olympic Games themselves, although that in turn turned out to be, as you say, um, a, a great success and seen as um, as a benchmark, I think, for not just sustainability, but uh, accessibility. And um, that in itself was an achievement. But I think the, the real focus and the real effort was on trying to establish a framework and a, an infrastructure that would serve the development of an urban community in that part of London for the next 25, 30 years, or, or grow over the next 25 to 30 years. So using the the windfall, if you like, of the of the um, access to investment that came as a result of winning the Games to actually help build a future for what was, at the time, probably one of the worst parts of a city in Europe. Uh, very low levels of employment, very high crime rates, the ground was polluted. It really was not a pleasant place. And one only has to go back now, as you say, we're, we're, we're seven years post games to have a look at the transformation that's taken place the the rate of development i would say it's probably exceeded everyone's expectations but it shows i think the focus that was given to planning and good quality design and a focus on not just a temporal blip on the 25 year horizon but seeing the game simply as that as a stepping stone towards a much better urban development in terms of technology i'm not sure that there was a huge emphasis placed on on that for the uh, for the site itself. There are some good examples of smart grids for for water resource management, for energy res- resource management. But by and large, because of the speed at which things had to had to happen, and the fact that it, that uh, the games had to be delivered on time, it was one of those projects that you couldn't couldn't delay. A lot of focus was given to processes and products that were known to be successful and uh, could be delivered with confidence. And what about the green aspect? Let's say it was called the greenest Olympic Games. What was it about your planning and infrastructure that made a collection of stadium, basically, green and allowed it to have a legacy that people are sort of sure. using I, today? I think I think there was a genuine attempt to, at the outset, to rationalise what was meant by sustainable, uh, sustainable games, and um, and it was broken down into the end, in the end, to uh, twelve key areas, and and it focused around issues such as water usage and energy, as I've said, plus um, the, the ability for every member of society to be able to access the games properly. It looked at the reuse of mis- resource and materials, and each of those twelve key areas were given effectively aims and objectives and they were set out as key strategies and then effectively those strategies were taken on by the various leaders of the different components of the game so each of them had an objective in terms of how much water they were going to be able to conserve through their building design or through um, reuse during its operations and as a as a cumulative approach it it worked very well I would suggest. What would you say has was your greatest legacy with that project from from your point of view? From a personal perspective, I think you know it was it was the double win, I guess that that the the games were hugely successful and and by and large went off without a hitch. And secondly, it, it has created the development platform that's been built upon and and is now proving such a, a popular and um, and valuable asset for for Londoners and for the um, the population of the UK as a whole. Larissa, you've worked with the Mayor of London as well. What was the the project that you were working on and that you had to bring the sort of technology side to? When I joined the City Hall, I was requested to firstly write a complete data strategy for London government, 
which is one of the things that I did on my PhD thesis that also became a book now, which is how we can use data to empower our systems and also to be reactive to have, for instance, know that something is going to go wrong in a particular system before it happens and do something about it or how we can test whether how our policies are going to impact the KPIs we want to have for our cities. So if we want to in- improve mobility, how a government policy might affect that. And by KPI you mean? Oh, God. Key performance. Key performance indicator, yes. <laughs> Every profession has its uh, <laughs> acronym. acronym yes. so. And after creating that data strategy, I got to work on a particular project that was to address the problems that we have in infrastructure provision in city, in here in London. So, for instance, if a TFL has to... That's you know, transport for London. Yeah, transport for London, they have to go and do something on a particular street. They go dig up and then do their work and goodbye. The next day, Tanswater comes, dig up the street again, and oh, then... Yeah. Exactly what Lord Brown <laughs> said, yes. <laughs> yes. So what it creates is it really causes issues for businesses. It wastes time. It wastes money. And also a lot of resources and also increases air pollution as well because you have a lot of congestions around this. And it's really not good for mobility as well. And also for the safety of the workers. Because in London, we have a vintage of technologies underground. We are not much sure about what is in there. So I think in the UK, it's estimated that we have 100 uh, accidents from electricity cables alone every single year. And that is a major problem. So my, my responsibility was to bring and convince partners because a lot of people, they are very, very uh, afraid of giving data about what are their uh, next project. Because one thing we have in London is also, it's not everybody that is accountable to follow the mayor's policies. So we also have to convince UK Power Network to really follow the mayor's plan and other companies as well. So the idea was to convince them to join a network of partners providing us with data, create a geographical information system that you can actually visualize how the city is growing in the next 15 years and then where projects should go to. So for instance, where we want to put houses because we know a lot of people are moving to the city, but we have drainage capacity in that location. How do we do about this? So Thames Water and a UKPN a Transport for London, they can plan together to address how the city is growing and also address any issues that we have in terms of transport accessibility, water supply, drainage capacity. So I created this uh, solution for London. It's available. It's called Infrastructure Mapping Application. So you can also find a lot of insights about how London is growing, where technology uh, is helping us to visualize where we have connectivity issues. We now have 5G coming up to allow us to get data from Internet of Things much faster. And But how do we provide that connectivity to every single citizen, to every single individual into the city? And also one of the things that uh, we put into that technology was the skills that we would need to realize those projects. And that is quite interesting because it shows the amount of engineers that we're going to have to have. And we have to address that skill shortage as well. Uh, just taking this opportunity also to talk about this, how much engineers we're going to need for this and also technologists. Because engineering is all about human survival. And then we can correct all the issues that we have in terms of natural resources. We cannot replace them. They're going to be gone. And also cities of first world like London, they have to start thinking about issues that we see in third world countries as well. So I, it's predicted that in the next 10 years, London is going to start having issues with water provision. So we don't need, we cannot afford only think about first world problems like putting drones flying around. We have to really think about what it is that is coming up that is going to affect not only the city, but the entire population. What you're saying to me sounds, both of you, I know it's got this this overall term, smart cities, which sounds like you're doing something clever and intelligent, but it sounds like common sense to me. <laughs> I, I would I would say it's um, it's probably the I mean this is comes down to the role of the engineer in society. I would suggest that um, you know we have serious challenges globally with with uh, urbanization, creating and, and resource depletion, creating climate change and. Uh, and social unrest, I would say, uh, in, uh, is one of the inevitable uh, consequences if we're not careful. Engineers have historically taken the uh, the advances that have been made in science and technology and, and applied them where they've been beneficial to for, for, for the improvement of society for mankind. The challenge that we have now is that the problem is huge and, the t- and time is of the essence, 
and there's an enormous challenge for us all to to work out how on earth we can resolve the problems that 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 we really built up over the last 50 years and probably beyond that what but, do you mean but, by social unrest well inevitably we are getting to the point where uh, a lot of people are even in developed countries are now uh, are not necessarily seeing themselves as equal citizens there are disparities between the opportunities in the workplace there are challenges in terms of the ability to enjoy the, uh, the quality of life perhaps they see others enjoying so I it's the haves and have nots but not just in terms of money but maybe in terms of technology as well partly i mean money will be a big root cause i suspect or the lack of it or the or the excess of it by others but there are opportunities to start to create a broader um, I, I think i think you know as a, as an industry we've seen environmental sustainability fairly well defined and and and, and has been tackled is being tackled uh, certainly over the last two decades most developments, most, most uh, professionals are aware of the challenges of environmental sustainability and working towards improving that. I think the Great Recession uh, focused people's minds on economic sustainability and uh, a lot of developers now and, and, uh, and mayors, municipalities are giving a great deal of thought to making sure that money is being spent wisely and that the outcomes are driving better economies so that success can lead to success. I think the the one big area where we haven't had as much focus and uh, and it's you know there is a need to start to all of us start to think a bit more carefully about and that is in, in terms of social sustainability. I know the Institution of Civil Engineers has been running a series of workshops over the past year or so to think about issues around uh, women in cities and how how they can feel safer and more secure around disabled people and and their ability to gain access to their places of work and 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 and, and where they live uh, more equitably so there's a you know even in london there's an, and and the uk there there are enormous challenges um, and we're a fairly sophisticated mature society i think you know in other parts of in other parts of the world those those challenges are even greater i must admit i remember being in birmingham once and i only had to walk literally 5 minutes from one building to another where I was heading to meet some people after after a job and it was one of the most terrifying experiences of my life because it was through dark alleyways and in terms of as a woman in terms of feeling secure I just thought who on earth designed this because I do not and I couldn't see a way out of getting anywhere other was. than through this really dark muggers paradise uh, stretch of uh, of walkway I know pretty well what we're saying because I remember when I was run over by a car it was exactly because of this because I was so afraid of walk on the sidewalk that I had so many trees and was so dark with no uh, lamp posts there. And then I said, I'm not going to go there, like behind those trees. I was so scared. And then I started wa walking uh, a little bit close to the sidewalk. And then a car turned around and then ran over me. So I was <laughs> in the um, hospital for a while. And this is a thing that really links back to what we were saying, that a smart city is not smart if that, 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 if that does not mirror the society we are building them for. And also, I think we have to bring this conversation more down to earth. For instance, um, self-driving cars. A lot of people, they talk about this is so techy, AI and all this. We can be reading our newspaper in the car. It's all about the laziness and the convenience. However, that shifts the conversation on smart cities to a small proportion of the population that will have access to those. We cannot make a smart city to become a commodity that will serve just a few Think about we have 285 million people who are visually impaired around the globe. We have 80 million people relying on wheelchair. Self-driving cars can really bring them back. They're right to the city. Because at the moment, you think of technology and you think of your Jeff Bezos, your Elon Musk. You think of very Dyson. You think of very wealthy people. So yeah. what you're saying is that these cities are actually going to be more beneficial to all aspects of society as well as being smarter in terms of how we use resources. Indeed and even in terms of connectivity we're talking about 5G and that is so fantastic for us to transmit 
a bigger amount of data much, much faster, which can enable self-driving cars and but, smart But buildings. even you saying yeah. 5G, I live in a village and it's not far from yes. London and we barely get 4G. Uh, and most of the time it's 3G or we get no service at all and we are less than... 30 miles outside one yeah. of the biggest capital, you know, greatest capital cities in and the that world. Is my, so. That's really my main point. So if you think about also that we are moving everything digitally in terms of government, a lot of services from government, they are online. You have to upload documents, even learning a lot of like free things you get online. So think about those people who live, uh, for instance, in poor communities they don't have uh, that fast broadband they might not be able to take part into this so i think going back to the thing about the right to the city this is something that has been neglected into the conversation of smart cities and we have to bring everybody at the table i mean i think it is one of the big conundrums we face the the wealth and the access to investment money sits fairly squarely within the private sector and um and they have a they have a they have a main objective in life, and that is to earn a return on their investment. The public sector is there for with a different set of aims for the public good, and and uh, and so, you know, the the the, re- the reality is that you're only going to. I think the, the the only way in which you can approach this whole problem is to make sure there's a very close compact, if you like, between the public and private sector. There needs to be some mechanism uh, an agreement in terms of what is an, a reasonable amount of return that you can expect on investment how do you, how do you even assess that when when it can be as in london's case extremely complex who actually owns what and how do you actually recover your return on investment when there are so many players at the table the public sector needs to be able to also feel that they're benefiting by Allowing the private sector to engage in 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 the uh, the affairs and the, the the helping with the operation of the city, but most importantly, as as Larissa said, the citizen the, it needs to be right at the heart of that that whole deal, and they need to feel that they are benefiting. Their people are using their data, albeit probably depersonalized, but nevertheless, you know, there needs to be some opportunity for them to feel that they are getting something in return. Well, let me move on to, you know, one of the biggest com- private companies in the world then because as I'm sure you're both aware there are plans to build a smart city neighborhood prototype in Toronto called the Keyside and this is with a company called Sidewalk Labs which is a, a sister company of Google. Now, their plans include streets that will heat up so that you don't need to put salt or gravel down to de-ice the the streets, awnings for buildings that will lower and raise temperatures. But those plans have actually been delayed because the residents are unhappy, partly because of having a private company have access to publicly owned land and also about future revenue and also because of data privacy. Larissa, there is a genuine fear at the moment that, you know, tech companies are not necessarily deemed the good guys that they perhaps were 15, 20 years ago. Can these companies reassure people that their data is safe? And what sort of data do we need to hand over as part of the the smart city developments? When it comes to data, things get very complicated, especially because what do you do with that data? And if that is for profit and not for the benefit of their own citizens, that becomes a big question, right? And there are some other cities around who did what uh, sidewalk labs are planning to. So in South Korea, a lot of towns, they were built smart from the ground up, which is much easier when you have nothing and then just start building with super fast uh, internet connectivity there. But I think there's a lot of issues in this proposal in Toronto because I don't think there is a clear transparency and you don't have the trust for the citizens that their data are going to be used for the benefit of all of mankind. And also how that data can then be used to extract insights that can help other lands, uh, other people around the globe who might be needing uh, a lot of help in terms of like managing their transport or having more sustainable houses and energy supply. And what sort of data is it though? Yeah, I think they would collect uh, information about uh, pedestrian movement and also there's also these are they going to collect camera video image 
or how that's going to be around. And if that is in front of somebody else's house, you can sense how many people are coming in and coming out. So if that data is provided outside, you can pretty much tell whether people are home or not. Because there, there are examples, aren't there, where some people are more at ease with handing over data than others. And you mentioned about cameras and having your picture taken. Japan, for instance, yes, is, is a good example. There. Yes, indeed. So, for instance, a few years ago in Japan, uh, so they are super open with tech. You see robots everywhere. So Japan is like Disneyland for any techie. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. But uh, they are still very privacy-preserving people. They don't like to be filmed or to be photographed. And then Google Street Maps, as you could go around and see, was not used in Japan until a few years ago. And I think that if the residents there are unhappy in Toronto about this, it's because maybe the company didn't do a very good investigation at the beginning that should understand what are the expectations of the society that are going to be living into that quote, like, smart uh, neighborhood. So I do think that in order to gain the trust of the citizen, transparency has to come first. And also what it is that's going to happen with that information. And who is going to own that? Do I have the right to be forgotten? What if I move from house, somebody else come in? How you're going to know is not me or is somebody else now? So there's a lot of things going around this, and it becomes a huge problem because we see a lot of scandals with uh, with private data and how people are monetizing on this and targeting you know people. And there's a lot of like risk of data leakage and fraud. So it's a very complicated matter, and I think people also feel they are in a big brother, you know, twenty four hour surveillance. I think that might not be a good way forward. A good example of well-accepted citizens-driven approach is the Oxford Flood Network. So in the canal, you have a lot of the times you have floods in there. So each house owner, they own their very own sensor. They're responsible for the data. They own it. They maintain. It's like it's theirs. And then they're responsible for getting the data in front of their house and share with others. So you really empower citizens. They feel they are part of the data processing. They have full control over that information and what information goes into the system. But a system that is a black box, that you have AI, that you have things working behind it, you never know the output of that. And that can become a little bit dangerous uh, in the way that it's used, but also unsettling for people. And I, I think a better approach would have been to give the power to the people because that, again, is private... Uh, yeah, I that's revolutionary talk there. Yes. <laughs> I'd, I'd probably disagree to a certain extent with Larissa. I, th- I think, in a way, this, is, this, this represents quite an interesting opportunity. I think there needs to be room for experiment and there needs to be room for trial and error. Um, I think Google and, and, or Alphabet, which is the, the, the umbrella company for uh, both Google and Sidewalk Labs, I think they understand the challenges and the risks of, of, of uh, kickback from their um, customers. So I, you know, and I know they, they've had challenges in the past. I think they, they will probably have learned a lot from that. And I honestly think that you know, this, the, this represents an interesting opportunity to see what is possible in a pilot program. The proof, of of course, will be in the future when they can start to reveal what benefits, if any, have been accrued through their approach. One of the opportunity I think it, it provides is to start to think about a much more integrated and comprehensive approach to management of the various infrastructure systems, all of which, by and large, nowadays rely on data and data management. But as Larissa said right at the outset, at the moment, especially in cities like London, a lot of those networks are managed either independently or certainly in a, in a, in a set of systems that are not necessarily speaking to one another. I think where you can find an opportunity to start to create what I think Sidewalk Labs would call a city operating platform, a layer of infrastructure that actually starts to connect all of those components that go to make up the city functions to be able to access that the data that's uh, accrued from them in real time and then be able to manage them very much in the way you know that we use the iPhone nowadays or a handheld device but th- when data is is valuable that's uh, quite difficult to get private companies to share something of value and that, give that up 
and and that I think is I think is the cha- that's the that's goes back to this challenge of the of the compact that's needed between the private and public sector. The public sector has a huge role to play. They can set rules and governance issues and make it a case that if if a private sector wishes to play in a particular role in in a in a city, then they have to comply with certain rules and regulations. Uh, Larissa, in my opinion. We cannot embed and infuse technology into cities if people living there, they are not comfortable with. And in fact, I do understand, uh, so I am also a computer scientist, most of the technology that we need to create smart cities, they are available there. It's just a matter of bringing them up together. Why private sector, they can move faster? It's because of the culture. They bring the technology people to sit at the table, which is one of the things that I have been talking for many years, that for public sector, for governments to bring technologists to sit at the table at the time they're making decisions about what systems to build, what data to collect. Because most of the time we see uh, only policymakers, which are amazing at making policies and deciding on things and understanding the citizens and the history of the city. But if you don't bring the technologist to sit at the table at the same level to advise blockchain, you don't use it here, you have GDPR concerns, you don't use it over there. We and are it's bringing those engineers in too. Indeed. So it's bringing engineers at, in earlier. Indeed. Bring them to sit at the table because I think that is something that is great. So Megan Smith, when she was CTO for Barack Obama, she brought in engineers from Google, from Amazon to sit there and to help the public sector government to move as fast and agile as the private sector. We have amazing, intelligent people in the public sector. We, the only thing I think it's missing is bringing the techies, which a lot of people, they call like the nerds, but they are not the nerds, they're the experts. Bring them to sit at the table and together create something because it's very multidisciplinary, smart cities. You cannot only have the policy side. You have to also to have people who are experts on all the technologies and things that you're putting together to deliver it. Would it be easier to start from scratch? I know that it's more realistic that you will have to apply your engineering and the technology and the infrastructure to, onto existing cities. But what about the case in Malaysia where they're going to build, spend 100 billion US dollars on four islands from scratch to turn these each of these islands into smart cities would that be for you andrew would that be your sort of dream commission to start from scratch you're smiling <laughs> well i think i've already had my dream commission which is working on london olympics <laughs> as, uh, but so i i'd be it'd be very um, selfish if i asked for another one i think we're we're already working in that environment in 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 countries like saudi arabia actually where where the um the whole focus is on trying to um, change the country's economy through um, and, and wean itself off its uh, reliance on on uh, carbon economy and refocus on technology. I think it is certainly easier if you've got a blank sheet of paper to work with, but it again depends upon the aims and ambitions and the I guess the eventual arbiter of whether or not these cities are going to be successful will be whether they're going to be populated and who is going to live there and how what businesses are going to move there and and how does is, is society going to accept them fully so as Larissa said there'd be there are examples of of uh, cities built from scratch in in South Korea Songdo I think is is a, a good example of that I've never been there but colleagues who've been there, who have visited said it's a pretty soulless place it's very very uh, well connected in terms of uh, technology but they wouldn't want to live there and i think that's part of the the difficulty cities are often built in you know have, have survived generations and are popular be- because of either their location or their position on the trade route and by and large they change and respond to change in a way that allows them to continue to trade or to to be prosperous, I think setting up new new cities always has a a, a big element of chance about it, and um, it'll be an interesting, in a way, experiment both from from all the all the aspects, you know, environmental, economic, but mainly I think social. That's interesting. As as we come to the end of uh, our discussion, um, Larissa, do you feel that that's something that we need to remember? It you can't just have the most amazing G wiz, wonderful building, all interconnected, all the right technology. 
if actually no one likes it. Indeed. And again, it also brings up to the point that the one size fits all approach will never work. You cannot get a city in Toronto built by a company X and totally translate this uh, to Japan. It's a different culture, different uh, readiness, digital readiness of the citizens as well, different building, overlapping of technology. So if we don't mirror the society we are building it for, and for the particular KPIs we want to measure, we have to have real outcomes at the end that's going to bring benefit for mankind. Without that, we are just going to have like techy tech flying around us, but really not bringing us much benefit in the end. My thanks to Oracle's Larissa Suzuki and Andrew Coma from Bureau Happold Engineering for joining me on the Create the Future podcast and giving us an insight into the engineering and technological challenges of smart cities. Mm-hmm.